quote and photo here from NK News document yet another extreme flooding event in North Korea, this time from August 2021. The torrential rains of this event caused enormous damage and displaced over 5,000 people, coming on the back of a significant dry spell, as well as repeated typhoon hits from the previous year. This event, and the many others like it from North Korea's recent history, highlight the importance of the environment as a key plotline in the story of contemporary North Korea. Environmental shocks, like these floods, like typhoons and droughts, these add another additional layer of vulnerability to a country, a people and a political system that are already fragile. To unpack this, in this video, I'm going to start by looking at the geography of North Korea and then introduce the concept of political geography as it applies to the DPRK. I'll then identify some of North Korea's most pressing environmental problems and then look at environmental degradation and how it relates to something called the threat multiplier effect. I'll look at typhoons and flooding as a threat multiplier case study, and then I'll finish up by looking at the different kinds of environmental regulations that the government has brought in in the DPRK. The first step in assessing North Korea's environmental vulnerabilities is to get an understanding of its geography and its climate. And like energy security, and in a related way, geography and environment are a pattern language. Geography shapes the evolution of political systems and the structure of economies, as well as shaping the unique attributes of cultures. You know, it's an important thing that shapes the history of a place. It helps define national interests of states, their strategic weaknesses, as well as their natural advantages. So geography and environment as a pattern language tell us so much about a country that informs how they are in the world and how they interact with the world. And really importantly, in the Anthropocene epoch, the environment is not just the stage on which the human drama is playing out, it's also an active source of threats and risks and opportunities as well. So let's flesh out this pattern language of geography and environment. We can start by identifying specific landscape elements as the starting point. These elements include topography, watersheds, soils and underlying rock strata, as well as the prevailing climate and weather patterns and flora and fauna. Let's bring this framework now to the Korean Peninsula. So as we can see on this map, the topography of the Korean Peninsula is extremely mountainous. It has a quite small amount of arable land for farming, and most of this is centered in the south. In relation to agriculture, this topography defines what can be grown where and in what quantities. A state's borders are often defined by prominent land features that are related to this topography. Now we discovered in an earlier video that the DMZ border with South Korea is not related to topography. This is an artificial creation as many borders are. However, there are borders, some of North Korea's borders are related to topography. So if we look north, to North Korea's frontier with China, we see that the border there follows the Yalu and Tumen rivers respectively, which both flow in opposite directions from the slopes of the large volcanic crater lake of Mount Pektu or Pektusan. This picture here illustrates a sunrise over the Yalu River or the Amnok River as it's called in Korea, which is looking east from the Chinese side of the river at Dandong. If we look at the coastlines, the DPRK's east coast is directly adjacent to mountain ranges, while the west coast is more low-lying and heavily populated. So bringing a strategic lens to this, there's therefore a greater strategic risk of foreign military invasion on the west coast rather than the east coast. And to illustrate this, po this point, Remember where the UN landed its counterattack in the Korean War at Incheon, which is on Korea's west coast, for this very reason. Another set of key landscape elements to consider are watersheds and river systems. So as well as being important ecosystems in and of themselves, 
Rivers are also pivotal for farmland irrigation and human consumption of water. All of Korea's major cities are located on rivers, and that's on both sides of the DMZ. For example, Seoul, capital of South Korea, is on the Han River. Pyongyang, capital of the north, is on the Taedong River. Important ports are also usually located where rivers meet the sea, and that's because these points have traditionally been a junction between maritime trade from abroad and inland communities, which are linked together via river transportation. So rivers were the freeways or the highways uh, that were the main route of transportation prior to the industrial era. North Korea's key maritime ports for Pacific trade are located on its east coast. So these include the port cities of Wonsan, Hamhong, Chongjin and Rason. Its key maritime ports for trade with China, though, are located on its west coast, including Nampo, which is at the terminus of the Taedong River. Soils are an important landscape feature, too. The Korean peninsula generally has poor natural soil fertility, and particularly so in the north. So this ends up putting a ceiling on agricultural productivity, and it highlights the need for external inputs of fertilizer if you want to in increase crop yields. So this is part of the food insecurity problem. And this problem is even more pronounced in the DPRK due to its lower proportion of farmland. So the farmland that does exist there has poor soil quality, and that's part of the reason why North Korea became so dependent on fertilizer inputs from the communist bloc during the Cold War. North Korea is also subject to a specific climate regime. It has wet subtropical summers and cold dry winters, and there's an enormous contrast between the two, as you can see in these two photos here. The further north you go up the peninsula, the longer and the harsher the winters become. But also importantly, the Korean peninsula is prone to typhoons during the summer wet season. Now that we've identified North Korea's important landscape elements, we can evaluate the human dimension in geography as we look for patterns in North Korea's development model. So let's begin with observations from political geography and political ecology. So here, what can this tell us? Well, geography helps to shape how states, provinces and cities are geographically and spatially organised. It can tell us how political systems and the material processes of the economy interact with place. And it also, it also can show the ways in which different people interact with and are allowed access to the resources of ecological systems. So in North Korea, like everywhere, everywhere else, there's a unique political geography that's evolved over time in concert with North Korea's distinctive political system, ideology, and economy. If we look across the span of the Kim dynasty since 1945, the official approach to managing the environment of North Korea has been highly anthropocentric and developmentalist. This specific approach was spelled out by Kim Jong-il in his 1982 text on the Juche idea, in which he states that man is decisive in transforming the world and shaping his destiny. And this is not unique to North Korea. There's a long lineage in communist ideology for this understanding of the human relationship with the environment. And this dates back at least to the Stalinist drive for rapid industrialization in the USSR during the 1920s and 1930s. In this discourse, nature is an object to be shaped for the glory of the revolution. It's full of resources to be exploited for industrial development. Man is the master of his own destiny and is capable of mastering and reshaping nature for the good of the revolutionary society. And Kim Il-sung is recorded as stating this on numerous occasions, this phrase, man is the master of all things. And you can see this implied in the mural shown here of Kim Il-sung giving on-the-spot guidance at this particular site during the 1960s. One of the more interesting observations of North Korea's environmental ontology comes from the British geographer Peter Atkins, 
who argued that politics, economy and ideology, as well as culture, are all coded into North Korea's landscapes, and deliberately so. Now, this is most glaringly obvious in the city architecture of Pyongyang, which really is a veritable ideological theme park. It's got monuments, grand buildings, these big wide boulevards, and these are all built in testament to the power of Kim Il-sung. For our purposes in this video, though, it's perhaps more interesting to see this ideological understanding of the environment coded into landscapes outside of the cities, to see it operationalized in official policy under the banner of land management. So, for example, take this photo, which I took on my trip to the DPRK in 2012. So this shows the remnants of mountainside terraces that were built during the 1960s to increase the land under cultivation and thus boost North Korea's agricultural output. Now, as you can see in the photo, these terraces are pretty much washed out and overgrown. You can see evidence through the middle there of land subsidence. So these things didn't last very long. All of the terracing projects like this one that were built at the time were poorly constructed and they were built more so on a foundation of conceit over man's mastery of nature than of good engineering based on the prevailing environmental conditions. So let's have a go now at putting all of this political geography thinking together. This photo is from a farm just north of Kaesong, and I photographed this hastily through a bus window during that same 2012 trip to the DPRK. This landscape is a completely human-mediated landscape, and it tells us a lot about the anthropocentric ontology of North Korean ideology and social organisation. So this is very much an embodiment of what Peter Atkins was saying about the ideological coding of the landscape. and. In this case, a picture really does tell a thousand words. And there's lots of stories to tease out here. So let's start with the story of the soil. Look at its color. It's a very light brown color because it lacks organic matter content. And this is indicative of poor soil fertility. So from this, we can infer the interface between local nutrient cycles and global trade networks, which manifest through North Korea's import and aid dependency for fertilizers. There's the story of the crops. So in this photo, you can see that all of the available land around the buildings is tilled with crops right up to the houses. We know from previous videos that most of the crops produced on North Korea's collective farms are appropriated by the state. So these smaller private, plot, private plots are an important food security coping strategy for the people who live here. If you want to know what gardening for your survival looks like, well, this is it. Then there's the story of the road. The road shown here is unpaved, like most roads in the DPRK. And these unpaved roads become impassable after heavy rains and floods, which effectively cuts them off as a primary network linkage for moving around goods and people. So this is a real problem in the wet season. There's the story of the houses. Now, this is interesting. These houses here are electrified. You can see the power lines. They're multi-story and they're relatively new. Also think about where they are. So these are near Kaesong, which is in close proximity to the DMZ. So taken together, this means that the residents of these houses are more or less politically trusted and have reasonably good Songbun status, or they wouldn't be allowed to live here. Then there's the story of the people. So there's a few people that you can see in this photo. They're all here doing farm labor of one, one kind or another. Now, like elsewhere in rural North Korea, these people are visibly skinnier and ragged than the residents you see in Pyongyang. And I know you can't see it exactly here because it's a still image, but these people are moving around slowly and very deliberately. They're pacing themselves through the long and hard toil of the working day. And this is what you see of people everywhere. They're not in a rush to do anything. And that's because this is the reality of life for people who are subsisting in a demechanized agricultural system. It's hard work, they've got quotas to fulfill, and they don't want to burn themselves out. You know, they have to be in it for the long haul. 
But going slow is also a silent resistance against the imposition of more difficult production quotas. Like other countries across the communist bloc, North Korea had a terrible environmental record during the Cold War. And here I dip my hat to the work of Peter Hayes, who's documented this in a series of journal articles since the early 1990s. We can recall that the dominant economic development model during the Kim Il-sung era was one that really emphasized heavy industry. Again, this is based on this ideological vision of man as the master of nature. And with this in mind, pollution was of no concern at all. It was only rapid development. And remember, North Korea is in ideological, economic and political competition with South Korea at the time. Uh, you know, it's a race. It's a contest to see who should be the legitimate government of all of Korea. And industrial development was a key part of this ideological contest. Now, not surprisingly, because development was the overriding concern, pollution clusters did emerge, principally through localised air and water pollution clusters that were centred around these major industrial precincts. And we do tend to forget this legacy sometimes because North Korea was essentially deindustrialized during the arduous march. But it does pay to remember that North Korea was the most developed industrial state in East Asia during the 1960s and 70s. So the legacy of this pollution footprint from that time still lingers. Beyond the urban centres, from the Kim Il-sung era right up to the present day, deforestation has been a significant environmental problem for North Korea. So look at the photos on the right hand side here, these different hillside landscapes. In each of them, there's no vegetation on the upper mountain slopes. Plus, there's a lot of cultivation of crops on steep hillsides and there's no real terracing here. It's just uh, digging furrows on very steep slopes. The map on the left illustrates the extent to which this deforestation has occurred nationwide. So on the map, the orange sections document where hillsides have been cleared for this kind of cultivation to address food shortages. While the green sections on the map are areas of forest that have been cleared for other purposes, most notably for the collection of firewood. So here we come back to the arduous March energy shock. During this time, and really ever since, wood has been the main domestic fuel for heating and cooking due to the oil and electricity shortages, and also particularly because of the long, harsh winters. So this domestic heating is really important. So cutting down trees for firewood was an immediate survival imperative for people and for households. And that's made the impact of this deforestation partly unavoidable under the conditions, but also it's made it more widespread and severe because it was a survival adaptation. And I'll come back to this point again shortly. North Korea has a specific set of natural disaster vulnerabilities that are unique to the climate regime of the Korean Peninsula and particularly during the summer. These most notably include typhoons and associated high winds, floods and storm surges. But sometimes this can also include periodic droughts where it just doesn't rain during the late summer. Now, these disasters are not unexpected freak events. These are regular and these are predictable. The map on the slide here illustrates the path tracks of all of the typhoons that have occurred in East Asia since the 1990s. And the brown tracks here are all the ones that have crossed the Korean Peninsula. Since 1990, there have only been three years during which North Korea has not experienced typhoon related flooding events, only three years. And even more disturbing to that, Typhoons are becoming more frequent and more severe due to the impacts of climate change. In other videos, we've identified several fragilities in the North Korean state. The overly centralized authoritarian governance structure, its weak economy, the ideological rigidity of the state, as well as its permanent food insecurity, the human rights abuses,
and the hostile relations with neighbouring states. So all of these problems paint a dire picture of complex intersecting fragility. In this context, then, environmental shocks act as threat multipliers that make these pre-existing problems worse in interrelated and compounding ways. Human security is a useful framework for understanding this threat multiplier effect at a more higher resolution. So the human security discourse was first articulated by the UN Development Program in 1994, and this framework has become the standard one for understanding human security ever since. According to this framework, there are seven different elements of human security, which are all interrelated with each other. And you can see these illustrated here. The key insight is that each of these elements is interdependent with the others and they shape each other dynamically. So if you have environmental insecurities, it creates insecurities across all of the other dimensions of human security. And if there's insecurities in those other dimensions, that can also create environmental vulnerabilities. And we see this playing out very clearly in the North Korean case. And the arduous march was a clear illustration of that threat multiplier effect in action. So environmental disasters were a factor in the near collapse of the DPRK state during that time, because you had successive years of floods and then a drought that compounded the energy shock that was crippling the food system and the economy. The threat multiplier effect is always worse in countries that have low resilience to environmental shocks. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change defines resilience as the ability of a system and its component parts to absorb, anticipate, accommodate, or recover from the effects of a hazardous event. High resilience is also closely correlated with GDP and institutional stability. And conversely, low resilience is correlated with state fragility. And we can see that illustrated here. This is a map of the Fragile States Index, which is updated annually by the NGO Fund for Peace. And note how poorly North Korea ranks in terms of state fragility. So looking, looking at all this together, this picture tells the story of an interse intersecting set of relationships. It's an interlocking dance of geography and environment with human networks and human systems. It's a story of complex interdependence. Now, imagine how a typhoon or a major flood might devastate everything you see in this photo. And think about how it would disturb all of these intersecting sets of relationships and create ripple effects across the economy and the society. Whenever there's a typhoon and heavy rain, deforestation increases the risk of cascading damages. So during summer rains, the rain hits the slopes of the mountainsides and it runs down the slopes at higher speed because there's no vegetation to absorb the water and there's no plant roots there that can anchor the soil. So as a result, more water flows off the mountains into the valleys below, and you also get more erosion of the soil on the hillsides, both of which increase the severity of the flooding in the valleys. So here then is where you see these cascading levels of damage and interrelated problems emerge. The flooding damages buildings and roads and farmland. The eroded soils from the mountainsides get into the rivers and silt them up. So this dirties the fresh water supplies for human consumption, but it also clogs up the small scale hydroelectric turbines, which impact on the electricity supply to a much larger area. So through the 1980s, hydroelectric, very small scale hydroelectric dams were set up along North Korea's many rivers to try and increase the energy security of the agricultural sector particularly. If we look at the roads, the damage to the roads cuts off some areas from receiving provisions and support. So this is a real impediment to disaster response. The damage to the farmland impacts on crops, so the harvest gets reduced. 
and there's an increase in food insecurity. This food insecurity, as well as the damage to housing and built infrastructure, then makes it difficult for people to stay and it compels people to have to move. So this creates problems associated with population displacement. And the government then comes under pressure to provide disaster assistance with resources it doesn't really have to spare. So you can see here, there's a full cascade from this initial, uh, initial environmental degradation. Recent typhoons have had a major impact on North Korea. If we rewind to 2016 and Typhoon Lion Rock, this typhoon missed most of the Korean peninsula, but it did pass directly over the Rasan area, right at the top of the DPRK on the 31st of August, 2016. And you can follow the storm track here and see where it hit. This event caused significant flooding in parts of North Hamgyong province around Rasan. And these are areas that traditionally have not been vulnerable to flood risk. The 2020 storm season was even worse. The Korean Peninsula was hit by five typhoons during the 2020 storm season, and three of these were direct hits on North Korea, which battered the country in rapid succession in late August and early September of that year. So first off in late August, there was Typhoon Bavi, and this battered the west coast of North Korea with strong winds and flooding, which damaged buildings, roads, factories and electricity infrastructure and water systems. And this hit uh, cities, including the capital Pyongyang, as well as Nampo and Ongjin. Not long after, in early September, North Korea was hit by Typhoon Maysak, and this time it tracked up the east coast with flooding destroying homes in Wonsan and displacement of residents from other flood affected areas all through South Hamgyong province. And then only days later, Typhoon Haishin followed a similar track up the east coast, all the way up to the North Korea-Russia-China border region in Rasan. Again, causing widespread flooding and wind damage to building roads and infrastructure. Now, unfortunately, some of the same areas that were hit hard by this 2020 typhoon season were again subject to significant floods in 2021. And this was an enormous setback for disaster recovery in these areas. For North Korea to take direct hits from three major typhoons within a span of just three weeks is historically rare, but it's a portent of things to come in the future. And it places extreme pressure on the country's adaptive responses. What it also illustrates is that North Korea's vulnerability to typhoons and floods is increasing as a consequence of climate change. So that's what I mean by calling this a portent of what's to come in the future. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as well as domestic agencies in South Korea, have predicted since at least the 1990s that extreme weather events were likely to become more frequent and more intense on the Korean Peninsula. And that prediction is coming to pass in the storm patterns that we've been seeing in the DPRK over the past decade. It's important to note that these same typhoons usually hit South Korea as well. South Korea, as we know, has greater resilience to natural disasters. And despite the fact that it, it still does sustain damage from these storms, South Korea is not as vulnerable to the cascading impacts of the threat multiplier effect in the same way that North Korea is, because North Korea is much more fragile. This is not to say that the North Korean government is functionally oblivious to environmental problems. This is demonstrably not the case. Kim Jong-un's first major speech as leader in 2012 was a speech on land management. And in this speech, he spoke to the need for greater environmental protection. Land management remains today the primary vehicle for environmental communication in official communications to the public. If we look at external comms though, climate change is often mentioned in articles from Korean Central News Agency. And KCNA, this is primarily for foreign audiences. So when KCNA mentions climate change, it's often employed as a rhetorical device to beat over the head of the Americans for their poor record of greenhouse gas pollution. 
So it's another front in the anti-imperialist propaganda against the United States. North Korea's environmental policies are coordinated through a government body called the National Coordinating Committee for Environment, or NCCE. Now, the NCCE is an umbrella organisation. It's there to help collaborate with the 16 government ministries and bureaus who have jurisdiction over environment related issues. So it's a floating organ of the cabinet. The NCCE is not responsible for generating environmental policy, but it does, has, does have oversight and coordination responsibility. In terms of the actual on the ground implementation, that takes place through the party committees at the provincial, municipal and county levels. So remember that party structure from our video on North Korea's political system. Now, looking outward from North Korea, we can also note that the NCCE is the central liaison point between the North Korean government and bodies related to international environmental treaty regimes, including UN institutions and other foreign NGOs. So this includes UN agencies like the UN Environment Programme, the UN Development Programme and the World Food Programme. And for North Korean government, that helps them to quarantine UN activities and funnel them through one institution in how they liaise with the North Korean government. So that helps centralising control over how the North Korean government interacts with these different foreign bodies. The institutional framework of the NCCE is scaffolded by a series of environment related laws and ideological pronouncements. Now, these dedicated environmental laws were initially developed in response to the destructive tendencies of North Korea's heavy industrial development model. So, for example, we have the Environment Protection Law of 1986, which is probably North Korea's most important environmental law. And this stipulates 27 principles for the protection of the natural environment and control of pollution. However, the important caveat, Ideological statements and instructions from the leadership, as we know, are more important as a normative foundation for behaviour, more so than the legal system per se. So remember what role the legal system plays in North Korea's political system from previous videos. The legal system is there to legitimise political decisions and policies that have already been made by the leadership. So from that perspective, the environment protection law is vague, it's open to interpretation, and it contains little detailed legal codification of rules, of oversight and of penalties for transgression. So it very much fits the pattern of the law and the legal system and legal instruments at the ideological function that they play within North Korea's particular political system. Interestingly, North Korea is a ratified signatory to a number of international environmental treaties, including the important Rio Conventions. So there are the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Convention on Biodiversity, and the Convention to Combat Desertification. And, and this topic has been the focus of my North Korea related research for a number of years now. And it's interesting because it might initially seem counterintuitive that North Korea would agree to sign up to these treaties because to be a signatory requires states to regularly report data and to have people for on the ground inspections uh, to again to feed data and information into the treaty system. That's the point of international treaties. Uh, is to share information between the signatories to make cooperation much easier. So why would North Korea agree to do this, given the nature of their political system? Well, there is some logic to this choice. And there's a number of reasons, but I think the primary ones are because international environmental treaty regimes offer capacity building assistance. They can offer capacity building around disaster adaptation and resilience, around reforestation and land and water management, around renewable energy, among several other things. So if you're North Korea, these are the kinds of goodies you want to get your hands on that helps you to circumvent the restrictions of the economic sanctions regimes, 
it helps you to overcome the the uh, lack of connection to the global economy uh, that North Korea suffers from and the fact that it doesn't make that much that generates hard foreign currency to actually buy these things. So participation in environmental treaties offers a way to get this assistance that might not be available through other means. And what makes this environmental space so fascinating around international environmental treaties is because environmental issues offer a rare space of converging interests between the international community and the DPRK. So this is potentially a place for engagement that's depoliticized relative to the, the really hardcore politicization of security issues. And we saw this start to bubble up and emerge during the inter-Korean summit process from the Panmunjom Declaration onward in 2018 and 2019 during that season of summits. There is an appetite for environmental engagement with North Korea from international agencies and from South Korea and some other states. On a personal note, in 2021, I was interviewed by a representative from the UN Department of Political and Peacekeeping Affairs on the possibilities for further environmental engagement with North Korea. So this convergence of interests is real, it is on the radar and, and organisations are interested in it. The convergence of interests around environmental protection between North Korea and the international community could form the basis for confidence building measures and humanitarian assistance, particularly around reforestation and soil fertility. And as an example, look on the slide here. This image depicts a plantation which was established as a reforestation project with an international NGO. Here's some of the generalizable lessons I'm taking from today's material. Like energy security, geography and environment are important pattern languages for the IR analyst, and they can be applied anywhere. North Korea's highly anthropocentric ontology of the relationship between human society and the environment, centered on the needs of rapid industrialization, is not really that different from what we see in capitalist societies. There's different tactics, but the same strategy and goals seem to apply. The threat multiplier effect, this is something that's observable everywhere, but its impacts are felt more strongly in weaker, more fragile states. And as analysts of politics and international relations, we really do need to pay attention to climate change. It's rapidly becoming the issue that is defining local, national and international politics for the coming century. By now, I also hope that you're identifying your own generalizable lessons from our study of North Korea that you can apply to other cases. And as you prepare for the assessment related to this topic, keep these key themes in mind. And also, what other key themes stand out for you? You can add some things of your own, some observations of your own to this list. Oh,